the worst possible way of your wish coming true. Ah! Hey guys, I'm Kate. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to another episode of Cooking with Classics. This time I actually read a short story, which you probably already know if you saw the title of this video. Or maybe you, like me, had heard a lot about the monkey's paw and general lore, but had not ever actually read the story that it was based off of, and therefore did not know that it was in fact a short story. Very short. Like, 20 pages short. So really, you could just go pause this video and read it for yourself. Or don't, because I am about to make monkey bread. Get it? While discussing this story, as well as Project Gutenberg, ways that storytelling is different depending on the length of the work and how I think the monkey's paw could have been expanded if it were potentially to be a novel, and maybe why it's even creepier that it wasn't expanded. And also how a universal message can be summed up into a single image and why that makes this even more of a classic, I think. Then I'm gonna eat my monkey bread while watching the Alfred Hitchcock Presents 30-minute adaptation of this 28-page story. <laughs> Truly an impressive feat since usually source material is just mercilessly butchered in the adaptation process. As always, first let's put some respect on Mr. W.W. Jacob's name and also set it to bake at 350. In researching Jacobs, one of my favorite discoveries was actually how diverse his writing interests were, or I should say that he wrote in like two sort of different categories. The one that he continues to be best known for, sort of these horror short stories like The Monkey's Paw, versus the stories that he was actually really well known for at the time, which were these like weird funny tales of like sailors and seaside towns and villages and stuff very different. But as someone who writes in a bunch of different genres, I just always love seeing writers who did the same. He also wrote for The Strand, this kind of literary magazine, and that was actually how he gained financial security at one point, completely from his writing, which is an impressive feat at the time, and obviously still now. Finally, as a bonus, though I don't think anyone should be kind of defined by their spouse, he did marry a suffragette, which, you know, just gives him all the bonus cool points in my mind. <laughs> Greased. I should say that I found this recipe by searching monkey bread that you could make with cinnamon rolls instead of biscuits because in the middle of this pandemic, uh, not a lot of biscuits around. People are obviously wanting to eat biscuits. We had these at home. So yes, trying to use what I got. We're gonna see how this turns out. As always, I'm also having the recipe. Um, you would think at some point I would just follow a recipe normally, but who needs that? It makes it more fun when it's a mystery for you and me on how this is gonna turn out. All right, I need to mix sugar and cinnamon. So let's bring it down and zoom in, shall we? We shall. Another thing that I thought was interesting was just how quickly the monkey's paw was adapted. Usually these sorts of things take a while to gain in popularity. But the publication of The Monkey's Paw in the short story collection, The Lady of the Barge, was in 1902, and it was adapted into a one-act play only a year later, in 1903. It's also been adapted into longer stage productions. I think that's done. Radio shows, one-off TV episodes, and of course, film. Also interesting about W.W. Jacobs is that he actually wrote an adaptation of his own work, which I just always think is so cool. One of my favorite books, The Princess Bride. The screenplay was also written by William Goldman, The Princess Bride. <sighs> yes. Ah! Get you a writing hero that can do both. Lots of clapping. Our oven is ready. However, the baker is not ready, so I got more stuff to do. Ah! You know, I'm a little bit nervous because the last time I did this, it exploded and hurt my hand. I'd never had that happen before, so now I'm just like, oh no. It's fine. This would be okay. Everything. Ah! Okay. <laughs> so now we need to take our cinnamon rolls and mix them up in this. Yes. So one of the things I found in reading all of these in quotes classic novels, that's the best quote I could do with the cinnamon roll in my hand. One of the things I found central to something being a classic is this idea of a universal message. And the sort of be careful what you wish for in the monkey's paw is like a tale as old as time. Cinnamon. Okay. Just says place. The reason I think the monkey's paw was able to trump all the other stories that sort of shared that same message is the fact that it attached an image to this concept. 
and of course the fact that it was particularly morbid. The image itself is fascinating to me because it's been included in all sorts of media. I remember one of the first fun facts I knew about Indiana Jones was the inclusion of the monkey's paw to signify a deadly outcome. So even though it's been adapted so many times, I think it's even more frequently referenced. Only the paw is needed. Oh, the paw. Anyways. Which is also how I think it's managed to cut through all of these messages. I mean, there's a freaking monkey's paw subreddit, you know? You can be like me, having never actually read the story, and know what the monkey's paw signifies. The leap into urban legend or even idiom is so impressively cool to me. Now let's dig deeper into the story itself. It's separated into three separate acts. And when I saw that initial little eye, I thought it was going to be like one wish per act. Nope. I don't know why I like to guess at what's gonna happen before it's actually happened. I think it might just be human nature, especially when you know a little bit about something going into it. To my credit, I think my brain fixated because the copy I read was from Project Gutenberg. I have it on my Libby app. Oh my gosh. First off, look at all the little highlights I did. So there's actually only 24 pages. Whoops. What? Oh no. And then the rest is just this back in Project Gutenberg stuff with various references and like copyright information. So going into it, I kept thinking there was going to be more that was gonna happen. So we get to the end or what I, you know, was coming up on the second wish and the third wish and they happened boom, boom. And then the story was over. And I was shocked because I thought I still had like 14 pages left. So it's just interesting having different expectations and it really just drove home the point how how quickly short stories have to not just wrap up, but completely tell the tale that they're trying to tell and deliver it differently than novels. All right, let's pour this over. Are we ready? I don't know. And now obviously how much quicker the short story has to tell the tale in was reinforced even by like the language that was used. So let's go ahead and talk about the words. sit by the oven while we wait. One of the first things I noticed was the intro. We start with the setting without. The night was cold and wet, but in the small parlor of blah, 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 okay? Then we move on to the characters where Mr. White and his son are sort of bantering over chess. I'm sorry. At chess. I thought it was so funny the way that certain phrases were used, like hark at the wind and beady of eye. And then finally we move on to the plot, like where Sergeant Mayor Morris is coming and he has the monkey's paw and okay, we're off. This is a pattern that happens in the second and third act as well. Setting, then characters, then plot. I think it's probably just because it's the quickest way that you can be jumped into the story or a new portion of the story. So there's really no time wasted trying to build it up if you do it in this manner. Might just be a short story tool that I've never noticed before. So anyways, I thought it was interesting. The actual structure of the three acts goes act one, intro to the paw, the warning, and the first wish. Then we have act two, where we see the result of the first wish, the death of the sun, and we really get a feel for what the monkey's paw is. And that it's not just, you know, care for what you wish for. It's like the worst possible way of your wish coming true. We also see our characters transition from kind of thinking the monkey's paw is superstition and whatever to then kind of doubting themselves and maybe it's real after all and really not wanting to test it on any more wishes. But of course we move into the third act where we're expecting for the third wish to be death. And we see the wife kind of begging her husband to use the monkey's paw to bring back their son using his second wish. And then of course the immediate use of the third wish after doing the second wish. So here's where we're gonna come back to my expectations regarding the ending and how it was surprised. It's so funny because my dad, who had read the story ages ago, sort of misremembered what happened and that he thought you actually saw the monster. I think because adaptations, they do show you the monster that the sun becomes after the second wish. Yes. However, this doesn't happen. In fact, <laughs> he frantically breathes his third and last wish. We have a single paragraph and then it's the end. I think this is such a good way to end a short horror where clearly the purpose is to leave the reader feeling creeped out. The quick conclusion does it. Like you have no time to really process or think about it. It's just like, oh shit, 
that's it. Now speaking of horror, which is all about sort of suspense and tension and okay, I'm up. There's one paragraph in particular I want to show you. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. The candle in, which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls until, with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and a minute or two afterward, the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke, but lay silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked, a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive, and after lying for some time, screwing up his courage, he took the box of matches and, striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs, the match went out, and he paused to strike another, and at the same moment, a knock, so quiet and stealthy as to be scarcely audible, sounded on the front door. That was three paragraphs, such a short amount of time, but he manages to, like, build the tension, have some tension, give you some sense of relief, and then build the attention immediately back up again. I think it's partially to keep the reader on their toes, but also to keep them with the character, Mr. White, rather than thinking about the paw or the potential monster that could become. Now, finally, let's talk about time and place. I highlighted this part in act two. She then waited as patiently as her sex would permit. Look, it was 1900, what are you gonna do? I also had to Google some words because I'd forgotten their exact definition, so, throughout this 24 page story. 28, 24? I don't know, it's short. I learned again about avaricious, which is showing extreme greed simian, which I kind of remembered was somewhat animal-like, but it's in fact monkey-like. <laughs> Antimacassar, which is like the piece of cloth that you put over like a chair or a sofa, and then fusillade, which is like shots or missiles fired at a very like quick repetitive rate. Also, oh. Yeah. So I'm supposed to let this cool for a little bit and then put the icing that came with the cinnamon rolls on top and then serve. Which means this is perfect timing to ask you to please do comment down below. Let me know if you've read The Monkey's Paw before. What did you think? I loved it. To the point that I actually want to go on like a short story spiral. So please do also comment down below and let me know what your favorite short story is, horror or otherwise. And also let me know what you think the biggest difference is when conceptualizing a story idea between like short story and novella and novel. Or do you think there's no difference and it's just how the author wants to expand upon it? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it's good with that icing. I decided to skip the icing, do cream cheese. And I know, no offense intended. It's sugar and a slice of lemon. You know, I said I'd never. But see, the store is nice. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. What the? The image. Look, you started to fall. I caught ya. Let me see if I find my phone. Don't do it, stop. Don't do it. Don't do it, stop it.